does not face a serious primary challenge right now. There are one candidate declared, Marion Williamson, one coming, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, he's blocked the D.C. crime bill. Some liberals, especially in the House, didn't like that. The, the migrants, curbing migrants on the border, or oil drilling project, given the okay in Alaska, mm-hmm. eliminating mm-hmm. some tra- The last two, a more progressive mm-hmm. policy, he's trying to limit that. But he, so he's trying to strike the balance, give some things to your base, but also get back to the center some. Without a doubt. And the only reason he has this luxury of time is because, as you said, he doesn't have a primary challenge. That was CNN host John King and panelist on new presidential hopeful Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s chances against President Biden. According to a new morning consult survey, Biden eclipses Kennedy and Williamson by double digits among likely Democratic primary voters. Of those surveyed, 7 in 10 said they would vote for Biden to be reelected. 10 percent responded they would throw their weight behind Kennedy, who announced his candidacy just last week. And 4 percent said they would vote for Marianne Williamson. Here to discuss further is Matt Sheffield, the publisher of Flux and host of the podcast Theory of Change, and also an alum, I believe, of Hill TV. Welcome back, Matt. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so, you know, let's look at this situation. Uh, you know, m- mainstream media saying Biden not really facing any competition, but he does have two announced uh, primary challengers. Um, what do you, you know, make of th- this kind of, is it, is it, is it justified to, to not really talk about Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr. very much? Well, this is pretty much the same exact thing that happened with Donald Trump in 2020. Um, there were basically no major Republicans who wanted to challenge him. Uh, in 2020, and uh, it, the Republican Party deliberately ruined or to, like got rid of a bunch of the primaries, actually literally canceled the primaries in order to protect him from challengers. So that's a, it's kind of the drill when you've got a president who's running for re-election, which it seems to be Biden is, he, although he hasn't made that official. Um, but in regards to Marianne Williamson, I mean, you know, she's, she's this kind of person who seems to be a perpetual candidate for president. That's her new business. Um, and, you know, she had like in 2020, I believe it was a 1%, uh, 2% might've been the highest that she ever got in any poll. Uh, she dropped out before any primary votes were cast. Um, so, and she has no experience of any kind in politics. So, and that actually matters a lot more in Democratic politics compared to Republican politics. Um, Donald Trump, he was able to leverage being a non-politician in, in 2016, and that actually was very helpful to him. Uh, but on the Democratic side of the aisle, uh, they tend to be much more in favor of somebody who has governance and experience. And then with Robert um, F. Kennedy Jr., um, he's, you know, again, not somebody with uh, any political experience other than simply being born to a in a political family. Um, so, you know, we'll see what he if he actually is taking it seriously himself and how much he goes for it. He didn't do his announcement with any fanfare or anything like that. So, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like he's taking it that much seriously himself either. Well, you mentioned that it doesn't seem to help uh, on the left side of the aisle when candidates are not from a political background and are independent, yet it does seem to be behooving both Marianne Williamson and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who are polling at significantly high rates, much higher, uh, higher even than Bernie Sanders was polling at this time in 2016. And of course, he went on to win 20-odd uh, states in the primary contest, uh, despite having Having a complete blackout from the media uh, and the uh, Democratic Party uh, very openly campaigning against him. So to people who look at these polls and say Marianne is at 4 percent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who hasn't even technically uh, made an official announcement yet, is at 10 percent. And with, uh, you know, what what is it, 70 odd percent of Americans not wanting uh, Joe Biden to run again. Do those polls not strike you as indicative of the fact that whatever trend might exist among Democrats preferring establishment candidates, something different is happening this time this year? Uh, Nope, not at all. And the reason being that, um, again, you have to look at the history. You got to always look at the history. So when Donald Trump was um, getting ready to, to, you know, ramp up his campaign in 2019, 
Um, I personally did a poll in which we asked people about whether Trump should run for president uh, when we asked Republicans that. And a lot of Republicans said Donald Trump should not run for president. So there's this in politics um, overwhelmingly now because both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party um, are very professionalized in terms of having multiple consultant um, classes that, you know, literally make their money entirely off of, of elections. Um, they are operating under, their, their voters are operating under what's called negative partisanship. So in other words, like people may not like Joe Biden very much, uh, but they're still going to vote for him in the same way that Donald Trump, you know, uh, his a pr large percentage of the voters who vote for him don't like Donald Trump. They just don't like Joe Biden more. And so that's why they vote for him. So these polls tend to, uh, overstate um, support like that. And and we know what the electorate thinks of Marianne Williamson already. Like, they've already seen her. They have, she's been in a debate. And in fact, actually, uh, when she, she only got in one debate, but Republicans started donating to her more than Democrats did after her debate. So she's that, a very different a really, person uh, than Bernie Sanders. That, that strikes me as a really she's interesting argument. Joe Biden, of course, who was president of the United States of America, ran for president three times uh, and failed uh, terrifically in his first run, was ousted by a plagiarism scandal, was really considered to be a political non-starter until uh, Barack Obama made him a VP, gave him a little bit of legs, was so timid about his chances that he was talked out of running in 2016 at all. It didn't seem like he would be able potentially to even beat Hillary Clinton in the primary at the time. So given the fact that many candidates, many presidents have taken a couple bites of the apple to actually be successful, it does seem odd to specifically say that Marianne Williamson, because she has run again, doesn't stand any chance of running this time around. Of course, she was the most Googled person on the one time she was allowed on the debate stage, the rules changed to exclude her afterward. And other people who are very much considered to be strong political candidates, like the vice president who has spoken of breathlessly about being uh, Biden's heir by certain members of the Democratic Party, also had to drop out of the Democratic primary without winning a single vote because, in, in part, she was so humiliated by the fact that she was coming in behind Andrew Yang, a relative unknown, in her own state of California, a state which, of course, uh, in, independent outsider candidate Bernie Sanders won overwhelmingly, both in 2016 and 2020. So I'm just really curious what you do with all of that information, not to mention Robert F. Kennedy Jr. polling so high when he hasn't even officially announced. You're just writing that off entirely. Uh, no, I'm not at all, because Marianne Williamson is nothing at all like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders has a coherent set of policy recommendations. He has legislation that he has personally sponsored. He has coalitions that he's built for decades. He has a record, uh, you know, miles long compared to Marianne Williamson. People know what they're getting. And when they when he started running and started actually people started paying attention to him, a lot of people thought, "Hey, you know what? This guy actually has some good stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna support him." Um, Marianne Williamson, again, at, when she was in that one debate in um, the last time around, it was Republicans who were donating to her because they wanted to troll the Democrats, and that is a fact, an absolute stone cold fact. Jeff Rowe, who ran Ted Cruz's 2016 presidential campaign, literally encouraged people on Twitter who are Republicans. Please give money to this woman. We need to have her be in the next debate so we can make fun of the Democrats because yeah, that's she's interesting immoral. because when I was working um, on the Bernie Sanders campaign, we were very proud to have so many people across the political spectrum donating to our campaign. We saw that as an endorsement of broadly, broadly appealing uh, policies and a broad working class coalition. I'm not sure a politician who balks at the idea of having people uh, who are Republicans, who are going to be part of their constituency in a country that they plan to lead. The idea of turning your nose down at those donations seems to me not to be an especially wise political position, regardless of if those donations are coming in bad faith. Um, but what do you make of this, Robbie? Well, let's uh, let's turn to RFK for a moment. Uh, you know, obviously, this has been a person who's been vocal on the vaccine issues uh, since, like, the beginning of time, even before, you know, vaccines were such a salient mm. national political issue, given the realities of of, of COVID, um, certainly I, I think there are more Republican primary voters who are really animated about that than Democratic 
primary voters, given you know the, the politicization of uh, of that issue. But is it possible that he can make a splash anyway, or you know generate more? T I mean, he's someone who has generated media attention, media buzz over the years because of his name and because of his single focus on this issue. How do you see that playing out? Uh, well, he, I think he has some basis of support being, um, uh, if you look at that morning consult poll, uh, you know, his, his support among voters, let's say 55 and up, um, is quite a bit higher um, than compared to the other um, age group. So that is, you know, indicates some affinity with, with some people who kind of remember the, the, the old uh, Camelot days. I, I hate that term, but... Um, nonetheless, there are some people who may have some residual fond memories of that and say, oh, you know what, I'm going to give that guy a chance. Um, so he, you know, and again, I, it's unclear what his policy positions would be because, you know, he hasn't really gotten into things yet. So we'll see what he, we'll see what he can come up with. But I mean, running as an anti-vax person, that's not really going to get you anything. Um, well, I, I will say Even that in the it, Republican Party, it doesn't necessarily get you anything it, either. It, it, it does it gets you a bunch that, of subscribers, <laughs> but that's not, not votes. Yeah, I mean, you, you have been very, you may, voice a very strong personal opinion about how you seem to think both of these candidates are in bad faith. Uh, it is also true, however, that I, I haven't looked as much. Robert Kennedy, obviously, is much newer in this race. Marianne Williamson does, in fact, have a policy platform. You don't have to like it or agree with it. But it is frustrating, I think, to many of her supporters, and I'm sure to many Robert F. Kennedy Jr. supporters, that the people who are very quick to be critical of them don't seem to have taken the time to familiarize themselves at all with their policy agenda. Marianne Williamson very closely maps on to much of the Bernie agenda, which is why she has uh, appeal in that sector of the electorate. And uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. appeals not just on the basis of, I don't think he's running as an anti-vaxxer. I don't think that that is a necessarily a fair characterization. But he has been also um, one of the sh uh, stronger voices in the anti-war movement. And certainly there is a broad uh, appetite among American voters for a candidate who is willing to show some more restraint with uh, international spending, uh, military spending, particularly with respect to the war in Ukraine uh, right now. So it'd be interesting to hear um, some substantive takes on whether or not those issues you think have any legs with the electorate the same way that Bernie, who was, in fact, broadly unknown with the public in 2015. He was not a known quantity. Of course, he had been a senator for a long time, but most Americans had no re name recognition of him at all. He was able to make a case for himself by making the case on this policy basis. And we'll see if both of these candidates are able to do the same. They certainly are ahead of where he was in polling at the time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, yeah, good to be here.